Welcome to the show, Meeting Interesting People. Today, my guest, Emily O'Brien. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Emily is a musician, and um, she has hobbies we will be <laughs> talking about also. And today, I would like to start uh, with your um, childhood when the music come to your life and <laughs> how it was and who was involved. And, uh, and then we will be talking about your music instruments you play in because they are, uh, some reason, it's like everybody knows them, but at the same time, not much as, so. Sure, um, so my family has a lot of musicians in it. Uh, both of my parents are musicians. I was born in Vienna when they were studying music there. Um, they both studied composition at various times. Um, my dad studied musical instrument building, um, and my mom did more composition. They both played keyboard, among other things. Um, they were both music teachers when I was growing up. Uh, so we did a lot of playing and singing around the house, a lot of playing and singing at family gatherings. Um, and. Uh, my sister and I both played various instruments. Um, I did play other instruments growing up at various times. My main instrument is the recorder, believe it or not, <laughs> um, which really is a lot more than just an instrument of torture for third graders. Um, I was given an, a recorder to play with when I was a little kid, mm. and I just really took to it. And I would carry it around with me, and there was always a recorder that I could just grab and like play something on. And I did a lot of playing with my dad, who, um, who was involved in the early music world because he built harpsichords and clavichords, wow. uh, historical keyboard instruments. Um, and he played guitar, and so we would play and sing together at home for as long as I can remember. Um, so, Where do they live right now? Now my mom is in D.C. and my dad is in Virginia, and I grew up in D.C. Okay. Um, and so... It was just always part of home life, yeah. And um, and I did take piano lessons, which didn't work out very well. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to take recorder lessons, and I was fortunate that you know most people don't necessarily know that recorder lessons is even a thing that you can take. Mm. But especially since my dad had been in the early music community, he knew better, mm -hmm. and uh, was and knew how to find me a good recorder teacher. Um, and I also everyone probably think it's very simple, right? Yeah, well, because it's simple to play hot cross buns, <laughs> and most people don't get a whole lot farther than that. Yes. Um, and I did play French horn in high school, and I played clarinet in middle school, and in college I had a double major in recorder and French horn. Um, and in the end, I really, the recorder and French horn have nothing much to do with each other in terms of technique. Not a lot of overlap in repertoire in styles. They don't play all that much from the same time periods. They do a little bit, but um, but the core repertoire doesn't overlap all that much. And I just eventually decided that I can't devote enough time to both of them to do what I want. Um, and so I basically stopped playing French horn. Um, I enjoy the recorder literature more. There's more interesting music, there's a wider variety. I know that may come as a surprise to people who have seen a long list of instrumental, of, in, of in orchestral instruments. Mm -hmm. um, but the recorder really does have a fascinating and long and varied and rich history and repertoire. Yeah, well, um, tell us a little bit about the history of recorder. Sure. So it's a little bit hard to pin down exactly how mm. old the recorder is mm -hmm. because then you start to have to split hairs about what really is or isn't a recorder, what makes mm. it a recorder. Um, for example, an Irish penny whistle is very similar, but it's not a recorder for various reasons. It has a separate history. It has a few physical differences. The earliest surviving recorders mm -hmm. are very, very heavily damaged because it's a piece of wood. Right. Um, but early Renaissance, late Middle Ages. So we know that they existed then. They probably existed quite a bit earlier with mm -hmm. a certain amount of variation that we don't really know about. Mm. Um, when you see depictions of angels playing instruments right. in medieval art, for example, yep. you don't get a lot of detail. You can't see the back, so you don't know that if it has a thumb hole or not. Oh. 
you can't see how many finger holes there are because right. some of them are hidden by fingers. Right. Um, sometimes it's kind of not much more than a line, so you can't tell is this a flute, is this a reed instrument, just from the picture. Oh. You can guess, but yeah. um, that doesn't tell you a lot. By the Renaissance, there's really a lot more information. Um, there's surviving original instruments, there's surviving sources that describe them, um, that say what kinds of settings they're used in, what kind of music they play. Mm -hmm. um, Henry VIII owned, I forget how many, but it's several dozen recorders. Wow. He was a huge music fan, mm -hmm. um, hired a lot of musicians, and owned a lot of recorders for people to play and entertain him with. Um, and in the Renaissance, um, instrumental music tends to be very, tends to overlap very much with vocal music. Mm -hmm. And the predominant texture that you find mm -hmm. is a consort of matched like instruments that come in different sizes. Mm. So in the same way that now a string quartet has three different sizes, violin, viola, cello, right. that are all related to each other, they're sort mm -hmm. of all like bigger versions of the same thing, right. a Renaissance consort is the same thing. Mm. Um, so it's a set of all recorders or all vials or all shams, and they can come in a wide range of sizes. So um, in and the you, Renaissance- you have all of them, right? Oh, I don't have all of them. I have a lot. <laughs> I know you have a lot. I have a lot. Um, the biggest recorder I own is taller than I can quite reach if I'm standing on tiptoes. And the smallest one I own is about this big. <laughs> and there's lots and lots in between. Um, in the Renaissance, combinations of those sizes are mm. really common. Mm -hmm. and in the Baroque, we start to see more of a different texture of music. Mm. So you have a bass line and one or more treble lines and chord filling in, chords and rhythm section filling in the middle. Um, so that, that's kind of a much more a melody and accompaniment texture as opposed to multiple equal parts that all interweave, which is what you see in the Renaissance. Um, so in the Baroque, you tend to see more often just a couple of smaller sizes of recorder that are solo instruments, mm. and they're combined with a continuo section with um, something like a lute, a theorbo, a harpsichord, mm -hmm. and then a bass instrument such as a cello or a bassoon or a viol. Um, in the 19th century, there are still recorders. They're mm. much, much less known, and they overlap somewhat with um, with some uh, with flageolets and mm -hmm. chacans that have it's some. Why it's happened is because they lose the uh, people who were making those instruments. Um, tastes changed, oh, styles changed. I see. The transverse flute mm -hmm. became more popular as the recorder mm -hmm. became less. Mm -hmm. um, the transverse flute, meaning the side blown right, flute, right, and the right. end blown flute, meaning the recorder, right. overlap quite a lot mm -hmm. in their history and in their repertoire. And they coexisted for a long time. And there were consorts of flutes in the Renaissance, too. Mm. Um, and up until about 1700-ish, give or take mm -hmm. the location, um, the word flute, or flauto, or right. whatever in right. whatever ang lang right. language, um, could refer to either one. Oh, okay. And they would, and up, if, up until sort of 1700-ish, if right. they said flute and didn't say anything about what kind it was, oh. then that meant it's recorder. It's going to be recorder, right. Um, after that time, give or take, if they say flute and don't specify, uh -huh. then they probably mean this kind. Oh. Um, but they would often still specify. So the recorder could be the common flute, the sweet flute, the flauto dolce, blockflöte, flöte bec. <laughs> so all of these, um, and, the, and the transverse flute would be the traverso, flauto traverso, German flute, querflöte. So the metal flute, when they um, appear in the stage? The metal flute is quite a bit later. Oh, okay. The style of keywork that's oh. on a modern flute mm -hmm. appears around 1812, I think, but didn't get popular and widely used for much, much, much longer. Oh. Um, but they were starting to add keys individually one at a time mm. to flutes even as early as before the 19th, before the 18th century. Yeah. And they would, over the course of the 18th century, they would gradually kind of add a few more keys here and there. Um, and the flute became the more popular and the recorder kind of fell out of fashion. There were some um, 
recorder relatives mm -hmm. in the 19th century that did have some repertoire, some of which gets very florid and very virtuosic, but it's not nearly as big a deal an instrument as the flute in that time period. So um, tell us about the experience, or it's maybe already not an experiment or experience um, when you start playing different recorders sure. and then combine, and then we hear it's like the ensemble playing. Yeah. Well, so just to kind of bring us to the present day, um, the early music revival movement mm -hmm. kind of, in a lot of ways, rediscovered the recorder. Oh. And um, repopularized it. Mm. And over the course of the 20th century, recorder styles and methods of building them changed quite a bit. And by the end of the 20th century, people had come a lot closer to relearning the stuff that 18th century makers knew about how to make a really nice recorder. Um, that doesn't mean that they're all, I, that our tastes um, and our Preferences are identical to the surviving original instruments, mm -hmm. um, but at this point, there's a really, really high standard of quality um, for. So the one you playing on, where they made and when? So the instruments that I made, that I own, mm -hmm. that I play, come from a wide range of times and places. Mm. Um, the oldest are probably from about the 70s. The newest are, you know, right new. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are made in uh, Germany, Japan, or the U.S. Mm. Um, there's a recorder maker in Brookline, Mass, mm. that's been around for over 50 years, maybe over 60 years, mm. um, and they have that shop has been pretty <clears throat> instrumental in uh, the development of recorders in the. Um, in the 20th century and in methods and in training mm -hmm. generations of instrument builders. Um, but they're certainly not the only shop in that category. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, we kind of tend to categorize recorders by being more or less Renaissance style or more or less Baroque style. Um, sometimes you do mix and match, but recorder players, unlike modern string players, really do expect to learn to play all those sizes. Mm -hmm. So there's all those sizes, all those styles, because mm -hmm. the ones from different time periods have slightly different... Is it difficult to move from one uh, recorder to the other, bigger size or small? Is it if you didn't practice doing that, it would probably be difficult. Oh. But if you do it all the time, it's not. It's like anything else. I, I mean, see. I think modern string pl as violinists would have a hard, harder time switching to cello because we don't expect violinists to all just know how to play cello as uh -huh. part of being a violinist, although some do. Mm -hmm. um, but recorder players, we expect that if you play recorder, you can play a soprano and then play a bass and then... I see. Um, it's probably the same as a saxophone. If you play alto, you play um, tenor, you play... A little bit more like soprano. that, yeah. I see. I don't know that saxophones, ne that sax players necessarily always play all of them. Maybe mm -hmm. they do. <laughs> 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 but recorder players kind of really do expect to play all of them, with the exception of some of the really bigger ones, especially so the Renaissance long, ones gets hard to reach. Yeah, how long you were joined the John um, Tyson group? Um, so that, I used to play for these Renaissance dances yeah. that he used to run, and I played for those probably on and off I for see. as long as he so ran So it's not, it's not a group which is uh, functioning all the time and uh, before? No. Oh, I see, I see. No, I mean, that was kind of, some of the time it was whoever he could get to show up. <laughs> and sometimes that was a lot of people and sometimes it wasn't a lot of people. Yeah, I remember that, yes. Um, so dr yeah. During the Renaissance dances. Yeah. yeah. But it still was lovely. Yeah. So It was a lovely thing. Right. Um, and I know you have hobbies, <laughs> and I would like to talk about the hobbies. So one of them is a furniture making. <laughs> Can you tell us about why um, all of a sudden? <laughs> well, we uh, moved into a new house and had a nice basement, and yeah. we had, you know, reason to buy a bunch of tools for various home improvement projects, and so I. Uh, decided to make some furniture because we also needed furniture. And I always, I like making stuff. I like making stuff. That's because in the dad was doing that, right? Yeah. And, um, yeah. And I like, if there's something that I see a way that I really want it to be this way, mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and I can make it and then have the exact thing that I want instead of like tearing my hair out trying to shop for something and then go to the store and hate everything they have. <laughs> I see, I see. You know, it's much more satisfying. So you're designing to, by yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in the in to me doing it with furniture is it's the same idea as like I knitted this vest and I wanted a vest that was a certain way and I so I made a vest or like right and I know you you do the cases for the musical instruments yeah all of them or um, specifically for pipes or for historical woodwind instruments I see. mostly recorders but also baroque bassoons and baroque oboes and baroque oh, flutes okay okay Renaissance flutes that kind of thing I see um, so that's uh, kanzanet.net. And I know you, you um, also were teaching a class in, in Metroid Library for like sewing, teaching how... Yeah, they had a, there was a little makerspace group yeah. um, that was running some free sewing classes. And yeah. I thought, well, I've taught music a lot and I've never taught sewing before, so <laughs> I'll try that. Well, I missed that class. Yeah. So I, I, well, I, there's I, a new library now, so we'll yeah, I know, have I know. it again. Yeah, so I'm positive it's, it's people were enjoying to do that. Yeah. So I hope we can use some photographs of your furniture um, and oh, add to our video. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And and now we want you to play some music here live sure. in the studio. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Do you want me to say anything about what I want to yes, play or absolutely. what I'm, sure. I'm going to use? So one thing that I think is that I want to say about the instrument that I brought. Um, this is a modern style tenor recorder. Mm -hmm. It looks a lot more modern than the recorders that you're probably used to seeing. Mm -hmm. It has a little bit more key work. It has less of the kind of Baroque shaped mm -hmm. turnings on it. Um, in a lot of ways, it is actually technically very, very similar and more similar than it maybe looks at first glance mm -hmm. to a Baroque recorder I see. Um, with some additions, mm -hmm. with some additions and some changes. Um, so it has a wider range, um, and it uh, and there are a number of models of modern, quote unquote, modern recorders mm. out there. There isn't only one way of making a modern recorder. Mm. This is just one style, one model, um, but it's one that I really particularly love. Um, and the piece that I'm playing is the first movement from a Bach violin partita, mm. which. If I were playing a Baroque recorder, I would have to transpose some of the parts that don't quite fit the range. Mm -hmm. But on this instrument, I can just put it into a key that I like and play it so as it is. So practically, what you're saying that it's not so many music was written for, for the recorders, so you start converting, right? Um, there is actually a lot of music also written for the recorder. Oh, okay. There's not as much unaccompanied music written for I the see. recorder. I see. Um, and a lot of music that we think of as being core recorder mm -hmm. repertoire, especially Renaissance music, they don't necessarily specify exact instruments, and you can play it on a lot of different instruments. Oh, okay. A lot of Baroque sonatas say that too. Some really are specific to one instrument or another. Um, Bach specifically writes for recorders in cantatas. There are Vivaldi concertos specifically for recorders. But a lot of things are also for flute, and recorder players steal them. Um, and there's 18th century evidence that that was an acceptable thing to do. Um, so we kind of take free reign and uh, take whatever we want. And as far as unaccompanied Bach violin and cello pieces, mm -hmm. um, those are such massive staples of the literature that everybody on every instrument steals those. <laughs> I see. Saxophone players play them too. I see. So, well, I know that uh, yeah. it was a lot of music convert from other instruments for cello also. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, such an interesting story about the instruments you love. <laughs> and so now we just be prepared to listen you playing a live here in the studio. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 